and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Talking About Games, prom Probably one of the few channels that covers as much of a game variety as I do. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> the man some may know as El Jaguar, but we know him as Abraham. How are you doing tonight, man? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. I can feel the, the power of the temple already. <laughs> I always tell people, I've, it's, it's, an it's an open place, just don't touch my drink. <laughs> Because it said only one man got got his hands on my drink. <laughs> I kept the hands. <laughs> I hope you keep them under chain because uh, there is a, a scary Mexican story, la la mano peluda, the hairy hand. So. <laughs> <laughs> no. Although I've, although I I will admit I find Maha Huitil's a fascinating weapon. Mm -hmm. I know I mispronounced it, but I'm doing... Uh, Makawitl. Yeah, ma Maka uh -huh. yeah I'm, I'm doing the best I can because, un unfortunately, it's ca it's kind of hard to get a proper pronunciation guide for a for ancient languages. It's pretty cool, but it's quite fragile. It breaks quite easily, but uh, very deadly, perfect to maim people, uh, to incapacitate them, and take them for the yeah. sacrifice. Yeah. Well, it is... It is obsidian. Obsidian is very hard, is very hard, but very brittle. Mm -hmm. But I usually start off with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Mm, that's a a legendary quest with many trials and tribulations. It, it was. Since I was very little, I always wanted to get closer to my my heroes, even though most of them were fictional. We are talking He-Man, we are talking Snake Eyes, Superman. So I, I wanted to be those heroes. And I started playing video games and board games. But I always felt, even the Atari video games and, and some very old Mexican board games, I felt like they never got me closer to that wish of mine or desire of mine. I remember having a very old board game. I don't think you've heard about it. It was called es Escape del Castillo Dracula. Es es Escape from Dracula's Castle. And it was basically a glorified snake and ladders sort of board, but you, you had all those details, Castlevania type of details. But I felt, oh, I'm, I feel like some sort of vampire hunter or something moving up and down the castle. But I started to feel, uh, is this it? Is there nothing that gets me closer to being uh, this one of these fictional characters? Mm -hmm. And then I purchased Calabozo, which is Dungeon. The, the typical dungeon board game from uh, David Megari, the Pasha Kada Dungeon. Yep. I actually never, never played the English version. I only played the Spanish one. Mm -hmm. So I played Dungeon and I was like, oh, this is closer to what I want. I actually feel like I'm some sort of a wizard or a warrior. Mm, but I still didn't know where to look for something better. And then I started to purchase comic books like any other kid. And I saw these ads. I kept seeing these ads for products that I had no idea about. We are talking ads for uh, Ravenloft, Forgotten Realms, Dungeons and Dragons. But those ads were terrible when it comes to getting a newcomer. They were perfect for someone that was already playing Dungeons and Dragons, but for someone that wants to get into tabletop RPGs, I, I had no idea what they were. I, at first I thought, is this like a computer game? W what is it? And I had no idea, no clue whatsoever. I think the closest closest thing that got me a bit more knowledgeable about it was an ad of this board game. Ah, what's the name? There is actually, ah, yeah, uh, Dragon Quest. Mm. There's a, a, actually a very interesting story behind that one, but oh. on how to, I acquired it eventually, but anyway. Mm. I Are still you have no clue. Dragon Quest or Dragon Strike? No, Dragon Quest. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. Which, 
has has me going like three different directions with, with that name alone. Mm-hmm. No, no, this is the old, uh, very old TSR board game. It sounds like Dragon Quest, like the Japanese game, no, but this is Dragon Quest from TSR. Mm -hmm. Typical Dungeons & Dragons board game that serves as an excuse to get you into the main RPG. Yeah, but it wasn't so, as cheesy as Dragon Strike, unfortunately. Mm. So, eventually, a friend of the family knew about my quest. He didn't know about Dungeons & Dragons either, but he told me, hey, well, I have this game known uh, as Advanced Hero Quest. Maybe it's what you are looking for. So he gave me Advanced Hero Quest, and I, that was, was my first contact with the Warhammer universe. And it was the Spanish version, and I started to play it, and I was like, oh, this is kind of like what I want, but is this it? Is this truly it? Because it's still quite board gamey. It's not exactly like your typical RPG. Mm -hmm. But at least it got me closer to what I wanted. It, it had information about White Dwarf, and I was like, White Dwarf? What is that? Is there like a, an RPG, RPG information in there? I started to purchase the Spanish versions of White Dwarf, but it was all, only the board game, no information on Warhammer Fantasy or anything. And I was at a loss. I was, oh, I don't know how to continue. And then I had this friend that was a bit shady. I don't know if I should call him a friend or a friend em, friend of me. But well, we, we got along somewhat. Let's call him um, Richie. Mm -hmm. So Richie told me, hey, do you want to play Dungeons & Dragons? And I was like, yeah, please, uh, do you know how to play? Where can I play? Well, there is this place where we gather. So uh, how about you meet up with us at this time? And uh, and it was kind of like a shady place, but I was, I really wanted to learn. So I told everyone where I was going first, of course. <laughs> and <laughs> I decided to go to that place. It was pretty much a hobby store combined with a bar. The bar was kind of like mm, underground. So I went inside and there were a lot of people playing, drinking, and perhaps doing other stuff. I'm pretty sure that they do, did other, other things. But as a kid, you usually don't pay too much attention to that. Mm -hmm. I started to look for people who could tell me how to play tabletop RPGs, but I kept going. At the time that Richie told me, I even met up with Richie, and he was like, oh yeah, probably some guys are going to show up and then you can play. And I spent like two or three days until I saw this group of neckbeards, like the neckbeard squad. Typical, imagine a Mexican neckbeard, that was pretty much it. So they started to, to walk into the store and everybody was like, oh, they are going to run Dungeons and Dragons. And I was like, oh, I want to play right away. Uh, where do I sign up? And there was this guy um, taking your name and um, helping you to create your character. But unfortunately, that guy, let's call him T. So T, he was like the best known bully. He was not the worst bully, but he was like this huge guy that uh, developed quite fast. And once you were on his sights, oh, it was, it was uh, painful for you. But luckily, I don't know why he never picked on me. But okay, but he was quite the uh, arrogant douchebag. When I got to, to the counter to, so that he could, could help me how to create the character, he told me, do you even know how to play Dungeons and Dragons? And I was like, no, no, that's why I want you to help me to create the, the character. <laughs> you really don't know anything, do you? All of those snide comments. So I created my ranger. My first player character was a human ranger because I was really into Aragorn. I wanted to be Aragorn from Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. I ended up creating my character, but later on I figured out that he didn't know how to play Dungeons and Dragons either because his explanation on Thaco or Thaco was terrible. So I got my character, I went to sit down uh, with the neckbeards, and they gave me this plastic Thundercat figurine. It was Chitara. Chitara was supposed to be representing my male ranger, but okay. So I had my plastic Thundercat and it was still greasy because those figures used to appear inside of uh, the bags of chips. So mm -hmm. <laughs> a bit gross, but okay. I put, placed my miniature on the table, the, pretty much like your typical taco stand, taco foot stand table. And we were like six in total. And the adventure began. The, I would call him the chief neckbeard, but he was like the dungeon master. 
was terrible at describing everything. He was basically putting you to sleep with his boring exposition that lasted who knows how long. I can only remember that the story was somewhat like we were the descendants of the, the gods. We were like the children of the gods. And we were supposed to be inside of a tavern, figuring out things, uh, trying to start an adventuring group. And then, I don't know how, but supposedly a group of eight giants ambushed us. In they were stealthy enough to get inside of a human-sized tavern. Yes, you, you can figure out that this game was terrible. They got inside of a human-sized tavern in complete stealth. And we were surrounded by eight giants. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh no. Oh. And everybody started to try to fight, to flee. I tried to hurt one of the giants with my attack. It was useless. I rolled terribly below 10. I started to run away. And the chief giant that was actually represented by a Tecate beer can. You know te Tecate beer? Um, um, I feel crushed like I me. Yeah, I feel like I should. It's one of the famous beers here in Mexico. You have like Corona, right? Typical mm -hmm. Corona. But you also have Tecate. So that was the famous beer. Mm -hmm. And the evil Tecate giant crushed me with his club. And that was the end of my character. And it was a total party kill. We were all annihilated. And the neckbeard was like, oh, great game. Oh, let's continue yeah, next Friday. And I was... Pretty disappointed with the experience, but I saw that the neckbeard has his photocopies of what appeared to be the player's handbook for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. I still didn't know much about it, but I thought, hmm, maybe I can look for things on my own, even though back then internet was not a thing, especially in Mexico. And so next Friday I came back in order to play and understand more. But the dungeon master was passed out in a table drunk, and he was like, what? Uh, we, we, we were going to play today? Oh, oh no, no, that, that's, not, that's not, not correct. And he f fell asleep, and I was very disappointed. I had no idea, so I thought, well, now I know that it, it TSR, Dungeons & Dragons, Player's Handbook, something. I can probably figure out something if I go to the US. So I went to visit my relatives in Texas, mm -hmm. and I went to Walden Books. Walden Books was one of my favorite stores. I kept going over. Um, I, there was a point I, in time where I was where I was jumping between three different bookstores at at once. When one uh -huh. when I overstayed my welcome at one of them, I'd go to one of the other ones. Um, <laughs> Walden Books, Barnes and Noble, and Borders. I would just hop between them and re and read everything I could until someone told me to get out. Oh. <laughs> and then I'd go back the next day and repeat the process. Hmm. So I went to, to Walden Books and I started to ask around, hey, I'm looking for Dungeons and Dragons. Do you have anything from TSR? And uh, a guy, a very friendly guy told me, oh, well, at the back of the store, we have, uh, I think we have a, an introductory box set or something. I was like, mm, that's what I need. And I went running and I found that the introduction to Advanced Dungeons and Dragons box set, known in Europe as First Quest, mm -hmm. mm, I purchased it. And that very day, I played with my relatives in Texas and as a dungeon master. And I, I was enamored, in love with the, the game. But I was terrible when it comes to role-playing. I, I, I could, you could say that we played it like a board game with conversation. A board game with, board game with conversation. So I thought... Well, I st when, mm -hmm? well the, er the early iterations were... War games with conversations, so you're not far off. Mm hmm. Well, except on the Dave Arnes on side. On the Gary Gagax, exactly. But on Dave Arnes, on, it was. Oh my god. Well, okay. Without, without falling into fascination with Dave Arnes, mm -hmm. I, I um, thought I could do better. But I had no clue. So I spent like two years um, trying to figure things out until I ended up. Uh, I was 14 years old. And I went back to the US and I entered this mall and I saw this hobby store and I witnessed the best dungeon master that I had ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. He was this guy just at the back of the, um, the hobby store. 
It, at the front, there were a lot of, a lot of people playing Warhammer, quite uh, noisy. They were playing Chaos Forces, you know, blood for the blood god and corn and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I went around the Wargam Warhammer <laughs> game and I came to his table just to see him run things. And I was completely stupefied, amazed. My jaw dropped. I was like, oh, like, I cannot believe it. He was running things as a dungeon master without constantly, what do you do? What do you intend to do? What are your actions? And the players, they never asked questions to the game master. They, was, they were always figuring out things through role play. They were, I, I take a closer look at the inscription and the game master would tell him, tell him, uh, it reads blah 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 blah, and then the player, I pull out my dagger, and turn around and say, "This is it, guys!" And and it was so immersive, so magical, and even the roles they integrated them so well, so smoothly, and I thought, "This is it. This is what I, what I want to do." And then then everything happened by itself. I started to clumsily try to learn how to play tabletop RPGs, and that's uh, until today. That's about 27 years of, of history of role-playing, more or less. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that said, you've you've obviously delved into into quite a few into quite a few different games. You're not you've never struck me as a as a one system guy. And given that you have the whole, that whole thing of um of run of running any game, mm -hmm. um. When would you con would you consider yourself a forever DM or have or have you alternated between playing and and DMing more than others? I I've alternated, but uh, for the most part, I'm a game master most of the time. Mm -hmm. oh. I've had I've had a sketch I've had a sketch that I've in the back burner. I just need to find the right vo the right voice for it of. You know that you know those real those really sad um ASPC ASPCA ads um I, w I want to do th I want to do that but with a gag of for just 7 cents a day you two can help these forever DMs find a home as a player. Uh. <laughs> uh you know either, the other the other one that I had that I'd considered even though I never was able to get it right and I put I shelved it was um, forever DMs anonymous. Mm. You know, a parody, a parody of a of an AA meeting, uh -huh. just just for forever DMs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because that because that's the kind of humor that I encourage in the t in the in the temple. Because well, there's it's always funny when people when people talk about how how they. Want, how they want to do proper role playing, and yet, and yet, I look at their mod, yet the modules that they're running, and I'm like, "You guys are doing hack and slash as much as as much as the other guys who are doing murder hobo shit." At least admit mm -hmm. it. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it's so important to consider that no one is perfect when it comes to running tabletop RPGs. You, you try your best, but you're not going to be like, "Oh, he is the absolute perfection in in role playing." You just try to do what what you can, and you need to be honest about it. Yep, nobody's perfect except Kurt Hennig. <laughs> okay, that's my one wrestling joke for the night, but I had to, <laughs> especially since he's from Minnesota. So, <laughs> mm. but even even with that, would you would you say that? Were there a few? Were there any cases of games that were presented to you as far as running that you said absolutely not and w and would not budge? Mm, not yet, but I can think of a few RPGs that I would never run. Like for example, I wouldn't run uh, Thirsty Sword Lesbians. I would never run that one. But if you tell me to run um, Heroines of the Last Age, that is also kind of like a lesbian game, I would run that one definitely. And well, thirsty sword lesbians is a is a fate game, and well, but there are people that take it so seriously. <laughs> yeah, um, fate has kind of become my whipping boy. Mm -hmm. Um, mostly be mostly because of the lack of guidance when it comes to aspects. 
Mm-hmm. Like when when just about anything can be an aspect, and that's such a crucial part of how that game works. Mm-hmm. Some guidance I think is required, and just giving a list of examples is not enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, you end up with the people doing those ridiculously broad um, aspect concepts, like the ridiculously broad skills in those beer and pretzel wushu games I pl- I played in high school. No, mm-hmm. no, it wasn't in high school. It was after, it was after high school. It was in college. Huh. Um, and the be fair, Wushu kind of encourages it because it's very beer and pretzels. But mm-hmm. fate isn't trying to be that. And saying, "Oh, oh, it's a DM call. It's a DM or GM call," is passing the buck. Because that because the GM is not going to have that kind of guidance, so just saying it's his, it's his call is um, not far removed from how Bethesda ex- wants all the, wants the modding community to bail them out whenever they make a new game. Mm-hmm. And if they if they're going to get shit for that, then I think I think people expecting um, GMs to bail them out of their out of the holes they've put in their design should get it just as much scorn. Yes, I think that that of course applies, but I think it applies to RPGs in general when it comes to the instructions. Mm-hmm. Sometimes those subsystems are a bit, well, if not complex, a bit more nuanced than expected. And they don't give you the proper guidance on how to integrate the game mechanics with the roleplay. Yeah, it's that lack of guidance is one of those things that goes both ways. Some ridic- Some crunch-heavy games don't give very good gu- very good guidance when it comes to avoiding the traps and some um very light on crunch games are just as guilty mhm um i will ad- i will admit that i fr- i i first found out about you when you started putting up videos covering uh, magi knights awakening which obviously I-, I have a bit of history with mhm uh, since the since um I've d- I had done a overview of that when it was sti- went before it was even out when it was still in um beta. Mhm. Oh. What w- what has been your what has been your impression go- going through the- going through that system so far? Mm, I really like it. Mm-hmm. I I find the character creation process uh, fun and unpredictable. And when it comes to the process itself, the core of the game, it's pretty much uh, Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition heavily modified towards the Magi Knight experience. Well, that's, pre- that's pretty much what it is, although I do remember when talking with Derek, he had said that originally um, he had built Magi Knights in um, Genesis. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the magic system, you can kind of see it. Mm-hmm. Obviously, that's Genesis with a Y. I have to clarify that because there is a Genesis with an I game in my library. Mm. Yeah, the Fantasy Flight game. Well, the now it's owned by Edge, right? I think. Um, Edge Entertainment. What happened was Fantasy Flight was acquired by. Um, just went... Asmodee. Yeah, Asmodee. I I almost <laughs> said Ap- I almost said Apogee, but that's a whole other company. Asmodee was on it went on a um acquiring spree about a decade ago. Mm-hmm. And Fantasy Flight was one of the people that they had. And Edge Entertainment had been around like they were th- they were one of the publishers of Anima, which is another rabbit hole. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but they were mainly the they're mainly a European publisher. They end up getting shut down. Um Fantasy Flight gets acquired. And Asmidi decides to have them focus primarily on board and card games, and moves mm-hmm. all of the RPG ends of, end of things to the newly reforged um, Edge Entertainment. Uh, and some of the thing, some of the main things that got moved with it were um, the Legend of the Five Rings RPG. The living card game is is handled by Fantasy Flight, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um. A fifth edition version of Midnight, which I haven't read through. I've um, been reviewing it. I, I think it's good. 
there have been a few changes that uh, made the OG fans somewhat irritable, but I, I think it's good. Well, when when it comes to things, when it comes to um, changes that make that make certain parts of the fan base irritable, I take that with a grain of salt, because um, I as I've had to deal with my fair share of purists, which, as a fan of Lord of the Rings, you should know you sh you should know all too well about that kind of purist. <laughs> mm -hmm. in, in this case, it was more like a gender swap thing, or a bit on the like. Remember in Forgotten Realms in Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition that suddenly all of the important male characters died. Oh, Kelvin! Oh, he died. Oh, what about uh, Bruin? Or oh, he's no longer the king. It's this female dwarf. And what happened to Kelvin? Oh, he was replaced by this female black. Uh, spellcaster and and you're like hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a little bit more un, um, understandable. Um, it's just that I've I've seen I've seen people nitpick like every little de every little detail that's off from the books compared to the movies as as if people were expecting a one to one transition. Mm -hmm. Except anybody who's anybody who's done screenwriting knows that you can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not. I'm not going to defend all of the ch all of the changes from one to the other, but you have to make changes when you're adapting from a book to a film. Ah, I thought you were talking adapting from um, system to, to yeah. from editions to from edition to edition. Um, uh, when it comes when it comes to that, there there definitely has to be ch there definitely has to be changes. I've um I've done adaptations of. One of uh, one setting that was working for one system and do a completely separate one. Um, mm -hmm. Like after I was disappointed with Exalted Third Edition, and I still mm -hmm. am. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up converting a lot of the Exalted notes that I had over to Godbound, mm -hmm. and that's what I've that's what I've used instead of Third Edition since. There's some oh, there's some interesting things with Exalted Third Edition, but the. Pro as weird as it may sound, the problem I had with Exalted Third Edition is that it takes itself too seriously. Mm. To me, it always felt a bit like an anime type of setting from well, the very start. Yeah, it they they didn't even they didn't even try to hide that in first and second edition. Mm -hmm. uh, Hiring, hiring manga, art, hiring manga artists, hi and hiring people like the Udon Group to ha to handle the look of um, first and second edition, as well as other manga manga like groups like Imaginary Friends. That cer that certainly isn't hiding that, or the fact that there was the running gag of an owl form the head in the GM section of Exalted. <laughs> like it. It wasn't trying to hide that it was try that it was trying to draw upon epics and and anime. Mm -hmm. But when I look at third edition, a lot of the manga esque aspects seems to have been seems to have been scrubbed out, and it's trying to treat itself like a like a typical high fantasy affair, and that's just not as fun. Mm -hmm. That's that's been my take at the very least, just. Looking, just looking at the visual style that it goes with, it feels like it's trying to take itself serious. It's not encouraging, you know, having having a sword fight while standing while standing over an army and using the tips of the spears as your as your stepping stones or something like that. Mm -hmm. oh. It's one, and of co of course can. Converting from Exalted to Godbound wasn't easy, but it, but I was able to eventually figure it out. Uh, so it's it's one of those it's one of those things. Um, I will admit that there's a that there are there are a couple instances I can think of of games I refuse to run unless I'm paid, and by pay and I don't mean like paid GM, I mean hazard pay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, the big one is Phoenix Command. Uh, I haven't played that one. Phoenix Command is one of is is another case of the of the problem that was 
seen throughout the 90s of trying to go as detailed as possible. Ah, I think you mentioned that one. Uh -huh. Yes, continue. Yeah. Um, it was used as the basis for the first attempt at doing a at doing aliens in TTRPG form. Mm -hmm. And uh, the pro it is another it is another case of chart hell. Just way too many way too many charts everywhere. And that it and I don't I'm not averse to detail or to, or to crunch in games, but it's a pendulum. You can swing too far on crunch light, and you can mm -hmm. swing too far on crunch medium. But whichever which way you swing, you've swung too far. Mm -hmm. You know, but. I'm when since you meant since you mentioned um, starting out with D, with D and D even even if there was that lengthy route to it, mm -hmm. um, what would you say the first non D and D game that you jumped into was? Vampire the Masquerade. <laughs> How did mm -hmm. I know it was going to be that? Of course. <laughs> yeah, you got you you cut your teeth in the nineties. I can tell. <laughs> Like I was get, I was gonna get. I had two guesses in mind. It was either gonna be that or GURPS. Mm. B or not, not GURPS. Um, riffs. I don't, I uh. don't see you. Do I don't. I have a hard time see seeing you even running GURPS. Mm, I'm not well, saying one of my favorite RPGs is Hackmaster, so I'm, I'm not uh, unfamiliar with heavy crunch games. Yeah, but Hackmaster's a parody. Yeah, but it, it's um, a parody with a lot of, like, oh, make your roll to see if you pass out from the pain. Make uh, this roll to see if you manage to protect yourself with the shield and all of those little details. And if you have, you suffer system shock. And if, let's hope you don't sleep on the blood, uh, with, in the blood on the floor, and things like that. Again, it's a, it's a parody. It, it, Hackmaster is one of the earliest case of a game design shitpost. Uh. I mean, I'm not saying it does. I'm not saying it doesn't work as a game. It certainly does, but <laughs> it a shit post is still a shit post. Mm. Then again, I to, then again I told you in in chat, <laughs> never underestimate the power of a shit post because you thought that about Dames of Astoria, mm -hmm. and then re and then realized, wait, this actually works. Mm -hmm. Um. And well, people thought the exact same thing when Dungeons the Dragoning came out years ago on April Fool's Day. And they've never played that one, or I don't know anything about that one. Imagine, if you will, someone taking Exalted, World of Darkness, mm -hmm. Seventh Sea, D and D, and War and Warhammer, mashing them all together and making it work. Mm -hmm. Sounds funny. The creator of it, known as Lawful Dice, had said that he made it on a dare. Hmm. And when it came out, everybody thought it was everybody thought it was a joke because it was put out on April Fool's Day. You know, kind of, the kind of shit post that's not far removed from like um, toy ha toy hammer thirty C. Hmm. Which. I did not make that up. I did not make that name up. That is the ne that is the name of that particular game. Mm -hmm. But the those sort those sort of shit posts or cr or crazy ideas are what ma or what makes the hobby fun. That's I mean, true. I mean, there's been there's been that the, there's. I have, on more than one occasion, attempted to invoke the muscle wizard meme into into characters, all because somebody had had asked on a forum once. We have we have all these different casting types for the mental ability scores. Why not one for one of the physical ability scores? And then about a week later, I end up making a a caster who 
you, who casts his spells by flexing like he's a bodybuilder. That reminds me of that character from Full Metal Alchemist. You know the bald, yeah. blue-eyed yeah, Al guy that Alex Armstrong. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, yeah. He when the, when the concept was getting circulation, everybody was making that comparison. Um, mm. I w I will admit that I decided to go with the whole cast from flexing by looking at Hans and Franz from the old Saturday Night Live sketch. Ah, uh, yeah, I remember those. <laughs> oh. In the process, doing it, doing the worst German accent you'll ever see, you'll ever hear. We are here to pump you up. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Now, the the whole intent was just, was just to find a way to troll my GM and to, uh, by annoying him until he until he'd tell me to stop. Because mm. every every single time I would cast a spell, I would flex. Oh. <laughs> In one in one ca in one case, I just I had dis I had distinctly s said my ca my character is casting spells with his with his shirt off, and then I took my sh then I took my oh, shirt no. off. <laughs> and after that, it was like, please don't do that again. I'm like, I've got I've got what I came for. I'm not doing that again. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes it's fun to tr sometimes it's fun to. The GM is going to be a troll, so sometimes troll back. Mm -hmm. But out of curiosity, shifting to uh, more sane things, up on the ti up on the um, title, not the title, the banner for your YouTube page, you have the title of El Jaguar. Mm -hmm. Where the hell did that come from? Because with that kind of title, that ma that almost that almost makes you sound like a luchador. Uh huh. Well, being Mexican and all of that. Well, <laughs> I think there are several factors to consider. Mm -hmm. Well, on the side of the luchador, I'm a, a martial artist and I know catch wrestling, so there's mm -hmm. that aspect to it. But when it comes to the El Jaguar name, it's because um, a couple of my buddies, uh, RPG is dumb and Big Val RPG, they are other YouTubers. They told me that I kind of look like Jaguar from the Rick and Morty cartoon i don't know if you are familiar with the character no yeah, somewhat well yeah he, he, mm, well the comparison is, is not exactly accurate of course he is a lot uh, stronger than me but he has the hair almost in a somewhat similar way although he has a more square jaw he has like a, almost like a uni brow so they started to call me that but it was also because i get uh, very savage when i get angry I've had a few people cross me on the internet, and I've been, mm, I've, I've done some things. <laughs> so uh, the El Jaguar is stuck, but it also makes sense because, uh, well, in, here in Mexico, the Jaguar is, I consider it the most sacred animal, personally. It's associated to the uh, deity of darkness, Tezcatlipoca. So, and I, throughout my life, sometimes people have told me, hey, you kind of look like a, like a big cat. A big cat. So I thought, well, I'm going to let that thing stick. From now on, I, I am Abraham L. Jaguar, and that's how, how things came to be. Yeah. Although, if you were to go full, if you were to go full lucha, I'd I'd end up have, having to ask, okay, Rudo or Technico? Mm, whatever fits my my desires or my needs. If I want to look technical, I, I would act technical. But I I have a preference towards going all out. No, nothing uh, forbidden, no holds barred. Yeah, I, I, fig I, figured, that, I figured I'd ask that kind of thing, because I, I, I love my fair share of wrestling ac just across the planet, even if sometimes I have to stay up in the, uh, in the wee hours of the day to, ca to catch some stuff, especially the stuff in Japan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> There, there's a reason I only do, I only do that like four times a year for the big, for the big four shows because I'm not, I don't want to make a habit out of, um, out of, out of watching a show at like five in the morning. Uh, you of course have seen the Sakuraba fights, right? The Gracie Hunter. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, I'm very familiar with the with the insanity that is Pancrase and how that was the 
play how that how that was the place where the murder grandpa made a name for himself. Mm-hmm. I.e. Minoru Suzuki, the grumpiest the grumpiest man in Japan. Mm-hmm. You know <laughs> someone who had outright had had jokingly had half jokingly said that if he wasn't a if he didn't get into wrestling he would have gotten in jail he would have gotten in jail and he was trained by the Gotch family, which is as old school as it gets. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yet, somehow, he's a massive fan of One Piece. <laughs> That's awesome. And he even even cut even cutting his hair to look like the Devil Fruit from that anime. Hmm. But you know the. That's there. There's that sort of strangeness, and of course, it's hard. It's hard to not talk about the f- the fight game without bringing up a lot of those old um those old pride shows, mm-hmm. which I did. I did. I did catch those, although I ca- although I would catch those things kind of late. Pride. W- pride was a very interesting promotion when it came to the f- when it came to the fight game, um, mm-hmm. and. I I do rem- I do remember saying someone saying if it if it was that good why did it go belly up? Because Dream Stage took the wrong kind of money. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like they, there was that whole scandal with them in bed in bed with the yakuza. That's why it. That's why Pride went belly up. Mm-hmm. And the funny thing is that w- at one point they got dangerously close to getting Brock Lesnar. Um. Like it would, there wasn't pen. There wasn't pen put to paper, but it. But they were actively talk talking. And he he was still. He was still in he was still in Japan at that at that time. It's that's a whole that's a whole other kettle of fish. Mm-hmm. But. With, with that in with that in mind, oh. It is. There's there's always a bit of um, there's always a bit of amusement I I've been I've been seeing especially with what you're supposedly allowed to draw from for your for your fantasy games. Because um, mm-hmm. I I talked not too long ago I talked with the basic expert on hit on his project Ma, um which of Maca uh, Whittle. Yep. And how a bunch of people were like, "Are are you are you even Mexican enough to do to do that?" He doesn't pronounce it correctly. I saw him a bit of his interview with uh, 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 Diversity and Dragons, and he said he said it in a very weird way, but it's Macawitu. Yeah, and I I do re- I do recall getting on him to put a pronunciation guide in the book, which there is, but it's but I know I'm gonna have some trouble because I ha- because. I unfortunately have an accent. Mm-hmm. He needs to learn to pronounce it well first, and then he he can put the guide. But it's very easy. It's actually maca. If you can say maca, maca, and then whittle. We like we like the video game. We like mm-hmm. the Nintendo Wii console. We yeah, but two, two mm-hmm. like two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think I think it's an issue of just a, a different set of vowels. So it's kind it's kind of like catching a ball with your opposite hand. Mm-hmm. And I can I can hear my old co- I can hear my colleague Zan in the distance laughing because he's ambidextrous and I'm not. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but just that just that kind of that kind of purity argument. I remember I remember one other project getting ru- getting run out of town because they wanted to do a wuxia project, but ev- but a bunch of people were getting on them for cultural insensitivity or or something. Oh, uh huh, and. It's there seems to be this idea this idea that in order to ma- in order to make a game that's based in a particular region you have to be of that region, but mm-hmm. I don't know about but I'm from the states. Does that mean I does that mean I have to have all my games set in the American Revolution or something? <laughs> no. I mean, if I'm running Shadowrun, it's gonna, it's likely going to be set in Seattle. Mm-hmm. I don't live in Seattle. 
<laughs> you have to be from Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm run, if I'm running, if I'm running Lord of the Rings, do I have to be fr- do I can, Middle Earth? Do I have to be from? Do I have to be British in order to do in order to do that? If I'm running Vason, do I have to be? Okay, I'm okay. I have I have, I have Norse ancestors, so I can't really use that one. I know you have to be from Middle Earth. You need to be a traveler from another dimension. Yeah, <laughs> it's the it's the selectiveness of of that whole of that whole thing. Um. Now, gr- granted, I d- granted one of these days I do want to run a Wuxia campaign, and I already I already know I already know that it's, even though some people are, g- are gonna go are gonna get on me about my bad pronunciation of Chinese, I'd I'd simply say. It's un. It would be unfair to expect anyone playing a, g- a given game to have per- to have perfect pronunciation. I think, I think there's g- I think there's always going to be a gentleman's agreement that everyone's doing the best they can. Mm-hmm. Ah, uh, because because tr- trying to trying to treat trying to treat that kind of thing as a possession, I al- I always find that do- that when you do that, you end up. Um, you end up causing more harm than good. Mm-hmm. Especially, especially since I think I think mo- I think most people with it within different cultures would ra- would rather pe- would rather people explore it than ju- than just the in group explore it. Um, in my case, whenever I uh, approach those things, if there is someone in the game that I am running that knows the correct pronunciation or some accurate thing about the setting that is not from my country or whatever. I actually listen because I want to uh, raise my level of culture. I want to understand how to yeah. pronounce, etc. But we never make it like, oh, now if you don't do it like this, you you are banned from the game or something. <laughs> oh, there. Have you ever heard of a band called Skilltron? Mm, I don't think so. They are a very Scottish um, folk metal band, yet they're from mm-hmm. Argentina. Um. Oh, they've played. They played at. Ri- they played at Rock and Rio a few a few times. Uh, although that. Although that's not exactly saying much because everybody plays at Rio at least once. <laughs> it's, it's like it's like say it's like saying that you're a band that played at that played at Vaken. It's like, do you have any idea how little that narrows it down? Mm. But I look at that as an encapsulation of of that idea. They are. They are very much fans of Scott of Scottish history, even having bagpipes when they perform. But they're but whenever the singing comes in, you can definitely hear the accent. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no there's no way that and instead of trying to get a Scottish singer, they just said, "Screw it, we'll do it ourselves." <laughs> That's very to... interesting. Does do they have um, Scottish ancestors or something like that? I don't know. From I haven't heard anything to in, to indicate that they do. Mm. I think that they I think that they were just fans of of that of that particular culture, mm-hmm. which in hindsight isn't that surprising because not too long ago I ended up going down the rabbit hole of the weeb culture in Latin America. Uh, okay. Uh, especially especially Brazil. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And and just how just how, or in the case of say Spain, how something like Saint Seiya took off over there. Mm-hmm. In Mexico as well. Wow. Mm-hmm. I remember I remember asking around as far as why and what I and maybe you can vouch for this. What I had heard was they had played they had played the first few episode they had, they would play the first few episodes like I think the first twelve or so. Um. On a on a weekday on a weekday afternoon basis, i.e., after school, for mm-hmm. months on end, and it would just go on loop for that for this long amount of time. Mm. Well, uh, here in Mexico, I think the boom came with because of a show called Caritelli. It was basically uh, a kids show, mm-hmm. and they started to run all of this anime, the typical the Dragon Quest Die, uh, Saint Seiya. And and she they had this um, hostess that was really very energetic. What was her name? Adriana del Castro. 
So she did great when it comes to promoting Knights of the Zodiac, but in Mexico, the dub, the ones who did the voices for the characters, they are probably considered some of the most amazing voice actors in Mexico, and I think they did great. I think perhaps, well, it's difficult to know because of the culture, but I saw Saint Seiya with English dub, and, and the attacks, they were, the voice actors did them so lackluster, like, Dragon's Rage, you know, like, mm. but here in Mexico, you have La Colera del Dragon, and then like, it feels like the guy is going to explode, and you got like, whoa, and here in Mexico, we are very spicy in that regard, we want to yell and shout and make a, a big fuss about everything, so I think that's one of the factors that Knights of the Zodiac uh, hit so hard over here. Something that I've learned when it comes to voice acting is whenever a show seems to have bad voice acting, nine times out of ten, it's bad direction. Mm -hmm. And with some of those early dubs, they would they would just grab just about anybody that they could. <laughs> a jelly donut. Well, that's more like localization, but yeah. Well, that, <laughs> that's a whole that's a whole other matter. Whole other and um, I will always remember the time that Al Khan, who's the guy who ran. 4Kids or 4K Media or whatever they're calling themselves this week said mm -hmm. at New York Comic Con in front in front of representatives of the Public Library Association kids don't read and then got surprised when he got hissed at by the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And he he had to he had to backtrack on it immediately because <laughs> Because mm -hmm. I I remember getting the reports and that I was and I was worried somebody was going to start somebody was going to start throwing trash at at the panel or something, mm -hmm. which wasn't an un, wasn't a unfair um, assumption because the infamous bottle gate happened in American football in, in that same decade. So we're we're a really we're a a gross incompetence during a. During a foot during a football game resulted in angry fans thro throwing beer throwing beer bottles onto the field, mm -hmm. to to the point where the where the ref tried to say that's the end of the game and, and tried to get the hell out, <laughs> then was to was told by the higher ups no you got to go out there and take and take a knee to end the game. Mm -hmm. You know it was just it was just one giant shit show all all over so. <laughs> the and after afterwards it got the nickname Bottlegate. <laughs> but I am f I'm fully aware that as crazy as that is that's that's tame compared to compared to some football games in in in, in Latin America or or Europe. I know that I know that it I know that shit gets crazy in in some of those games. Dangerous, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> dangerous or in so, or in some cases just deafening because of those fucking vuvuzelas. <laughs> I'm. I'd like I'd like to say that I'd like to say those are the most annoying horns I've I've ever had I've ever had to deal with. But then I remember that I've used them to I used to use them to um deter deter Bible salesmen from coming into the from coming close to the house. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> or 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 similar means of annoying them because I kept telling them stay I kept telling them stay away we're not interested they kept coming so I was like all right I tried being nice now I got to be an asshole mm. and the and blowing and blowing a horn in front in front of them it was my way of getting them to leave mm. or <laughs> or blowing a whistle or just annoying them but with I mean, if I if I do know I do know that if I ever run um if I ever run something like Scion again with given that it does have some of the Aztec deities in that in um that game I'd probably end up contacting you to try and get some pronunciations right. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Because I don't I've had people screw up my actual name, so I try so I try not to screw up other names if I can help it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm again doing the best I can, but I at least I at least would like to try and do better. And I'm mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure that there's some cultural names that you've stumbled with just because of the accent. Mm -hmm. uh, 
pro probably, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say probably some um, Eastern European names might, might be a bit of trouble. Yeah, probably. And to be fair, names in places like Poland are trouble for everybody. Mm hmm There are a lot of W's and, and strange Z's and, and C's and... <laughs> Whenever people whenever people say that in, that English is a is a is a dumb language that makes no sense, I'm always like, there are worse offenders. <laughs> like, I well, actually have uh, Polish ancestors on the side of my father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why Zetina with Z is actually a Polish name. Mm -hmm. I actually talked to a, a Polish guy about what like uh, a year ago. And he said, "Your name is Zetina. Is it from? Is it from here? Yes, yes, it's Polish." Yeah, I, I could, I could certainly see that. Oh, uh, now, when it comes, to, when it comes to running games for people, are there, are there any genres that come to mind that you, that you've that you've been a little bit hesitant with more more than others, or is it everything's on the table? Hmm. I think pretty much everything is on the table except no. I I don't think I would. Maybe if they were to ask me to run something that has absolutely nothing related to psionics, magic, the supernatural. I mean, like the most material, materialistic game possible. Perhaps I would hesitate for a moment, but I still enjoy that. Uh, noir materialistic experience every now and then. Mm -hmm. uh, so, th so the more gr the more grounded ones you'd st you'd still do, like, s like say, ba I was gonna say base gumshoe, but most of the gumshoe settings that I know of have some sort of supernatural element. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, there's the crazy stuff in Trail of Cthulhu. There's Knights Black Agents, which is vampires and spy fiction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is not a combination you're going to hear often. Um, no. There was obviously the occult stuff with esoter with esoterrorists, and and the Yellow King, mm -hmm. as well as Knights Black Agents, which is doing the gumshoe thing just with supers. Mm hmm. Um. Uh, but obviously, when when running a bunch of a bunch of games for people. There's going to be differing levels of experience. Um, mm -hmm. Have you ever had a case where the where the whole table was nothing but newbies, or was there always somebody who was a little more experienced than everybody else? No, I've had complete newbies uh, at the table, but it's uh, I always I think I do a pretty good job when it comes to getting them to to experience tabletop RPGs. I just tell them I'm going to describe the situation. And you can interact with with the situation by describing your actions. You describe what your character does, and I will tell you what to roll. Mm -hmm. And then something happens, and it it always goes on like that. Yeah. I've when I've brought in new when I brought in newbies, I usually t I usually tell them to think of things like t Tony and Tina's wedding. Mm. Uh, How do you mean? Oh, well, for for a bit of context, Tony and Tina's wedding is this. Interactive play. Um, mm -hmm. It's a it's a pretty it's a pretty common one in ver in various areas. One the at, when we're um, the audience is going to be interacting with some of the actors, mm -hmm. and it's lar it's largely improvised, mm. which is part of which is part of the appeal. You d because you've got different people. Anytime you go to a showing of it, um, the way that the way that things pan out is not always going to be the same. Um, mm -hmm. Here in here in Minnesota, Triple Espresso was doing a similar thing for years, but mm. you know that whole that whole getting into character and, and immersion in a very simple way. I mean, you don't you don't really have a huge backstory when you're do, when you're at one of those shows because you're just a part of the audience who happens to who might happen to be part of the show, um, completely um completely improvised. Mm. Um. And tr truth be told, there there are there are some people there are some people's backgrounds that make it that make it a lot easier. As 
weird as this may sound, people with a with more of a video game background, I've I found have an e have an easier time, or people with a manga background have an easier time, as well as as obviously people with an improv background or just theater kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think bec I think because they don't they don't have the they don't have certain assumptions. Mm -hmm. You know the the idea that you have to role play a certain way. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of, that's kind of what that's kind of what I mean by lean by having them lean more into into saying role playing is just improv theater with rules than than anything else. And sometimes I'll bring up like cop, like cops and robbers to help them get the point because everybody played cops and robbers as kids. Mm. Or so, or some or some equivalent. Mm -hmm. But and when it when now when it comes to running a variety of systems, um, if have you had have you had cases where you were tasked with run, with running a given game for a system that at, at the time you were unfamiliar with? Mm. No, because well, I I always prepare a lot, perhaps even too much for any tabletop RPG that I'm going to run. So I never felt you can like never prepare was... too much. <laughs> so I always um, I never felt like a fish out of the water. Like, oh no, how do you run the system? How do, how do you even role play this? I've never experienced that because of the preparation. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm guessing I'm guessing that in most cases you give you gave yourself like a week or two weeks to prep. Mm -hmm. Depending on the system and how simple it is, I I could I could see that, especially I although I'd I'd imagine some systems take a bit more would take a bit more time than just a week. Mm -hmm. uh, though though continuing on from that, do you utilize a se a session zero? Or in in some of the cases, that's just not tenable. I I always apply it, but it's kind of like a ten minute thing or a five minute thing. I've never actually had that problem with oh we didn't uh, make things clear in session zero. But I think it's it also has to do with you uh, choosing the right people. Mm. Of course, that doesn't mean I've always had the best players. I've had some terrible players. In fact, there is a uh, one of the worst players that I've had. Um, you can find it in my uh, the playlist of the Curse of Strath game that I ran online. The first player that I had by the name of Mr. Woof, one of the worst players I have ever seen, because he ignored everything from that mini, uh, not only the mini session zero, but also everything that was agreed upon in the Discord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he, so he was the he was the equivalent of that guy. It was that guy, but to it fit, it fit this stereotype so well, so incredibly well. But even to comedic extent, to comedic degree, for example, just before we we, we started, we, just before we started to to play the session, everybody at the table, we, we all said, and remember, no out of character questions. Now, if people want to have out of character questions in their role playing games, go ahead, that's your thing. But for that session, we said. No out of character questions. And the first thing this idiot did. Do I recognize that man? <laughs> to the game master, to the game master that is not there in, in the fiction. And I was like, oh boy, this is going to take a lot of, of tr this is going to give me trouble. But I actually ran the session forcing him to roleplay because every time he, he asked something directly to me, he, I said, you speak to no one in particular, or you talk to the gods, but they don't answer. And then it was like, he was like, oh yeah, now I see. Uh, mm, I look at the man to see if I recognize him, and but he kept stumbling the entire time, ignoring almost everything. He only lasted one session. <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing. Often in, often in those kind of situations, the rest of the table will self-police. Mm-hmm. Of yes, they actually did that. Um, one of my other players, he was like, "Are you feeling all right? You're talking to no one." Like, 
yeah, and th those are um, those are always the ca the cases where where everything comes together, where you don't where um where things end up going in a direction that you may or may not have already planned, but absent of you actually nudging things. Mm -hmm. um, I am curious if in, if you had any ca any case where. It felt like some. It felt like a particular person's die rolls were cursed, no matter what. Like no matter no matter what they rolled, they always ended up um, either botching or just or just whiffing. Many times, and I always encourage uh, players when they go through that uh, hmm, that hexing, <laughs> that curse, that they role play as best as they can, and I will grant uh, huge bonuses if the role play makes sense with the context. Sometimes I even grant them automatic successes. The, you know, the typical situation that perhaps a player is fighting this bad guy. Uh, you're, you're running your typical D20 system and keeps rolling four, five, four. And the player just throws his sword and says, I, I run at the enemy and tackle him with all my might, putting myself at risk. And I give him an automatic success, even though he took some wounds trying to tackle the guy. And there you go. Now he contributed. He made his contribution to, to the battle. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, sometimes I, I will admit that sometimes when that happens, I will I will pause and say, and say, you find some new dice. Or in, or in some cases, take the dice aside and w wash them, and bl as if I'm blessing them <laughs> <laughs> with salt. Yeah, yeah. What? Um, put wash them. Wash them. Put put salt on. Put salt on them. Um, hold them. Hold them up over incense. Something to <laughs> let to bless the dice. Be and whenever somebody's like, "What the hell are you doing?" I'm like, "I'm the gaming monk. Monks have to double as priests sometimes." Mm -hmm. So if so if I have to if I have to bless the dice to make them stop rolling like shit, then I will. <laughs> and worst worst case scenario, if it still doesn't work, I'll say okay. Af after the session, um, you get hammer time, mm -hmm. which is a nice way of saying we take we take the dice into the back and I I um give I give them a sledge and I say have at it. Mm hmm. You know. But then the the evil spirit inside of the dice will be released. <laughs> I the the reason the the reason I the the idea came from the inf the whole um, fax machine scene in Office Space. Ah, uh, okay. You know, where after they got fired from Inatech, <laughs> one of them had stolen the fax machine, and they decided to um get get out get out months if not years of str of stress that that thing had caused by beating the holy hell out of it with bats mm -hmm. <laughs> it w it's it's in that particular vein the mm -hmm. only annoying part is when somebody keeps missing <laughs> you know you're it's not the dice is on a the dice is on a stump and you're supposed to hit you're supposed to hit it with a sledgy mm-hmm and sometimes somebody keeps missing because you're because they can't seem to get an overhand hit right. Mm -hmm. It I reminds me of that scene in Texas Chainsaw Massacre when Grandpa they give a, a hammer to Grandpa to see if I, he can kill the victim, and he keeps missing all the time. Mm -hmm. Like doing doing a ch doing a chop is not e is not easy. Mm -hmm. Uh then ag then again it's one of those things that everybody overlooks or just or just comes off silly like since you've done you've done martial arts you you probably find it just as just as silly um that that um bows are considered a dexterity weapon mhm mm i've al i always found that i always found that kind of silly because you've probably drawn a bow at least once Mm -hmm. The first time I, I was quite surprised it was not as easy as you see it in the movies. Which is which is why I've always laughed when you when you see in the movies some some ninety five pound woman wielding wielding a bow that's almost half as long as as long as she is tall. Mm -hmm. Like 
I have I have drawn I have drawn like English longbows. Those things are <laughs> are a royal pain. Mm -hmm. It's an easy workout, though. <laughs> you are going to yeah. get a workout f trying to draw that thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to draw one of those one of those Japanese yumis. You know, the ones that are taller than the person drawing it. Mm -hmm. But there are some exceptions. I th I remember Legend of the Five Rings had it that you had to have a certain strength score in order to, in order to draw in order to draw the heavier bows, mm -hmm. which. It's not not ideal, not ideal, but it's at least better. Because you do you do need to have good chest muscles to um, draw a bow. Mm hmm. I mean, I was gonna say a crossbow I could see as a dexterity weapon, but even but no, even that you're gonna need some strength. Unless you've got one of those cr unless you've got one of those cranks, which are another set of problems. Mm hmm. You know, the, you know the crank you're supposed to use with both hands. Uh huh. Uh, I've used them, and if if you don't have the perfect rhythm, you've got to start right from the get go. <laughs> I've never operated a crossbow. Is it really difficult? Um, it's finicky. Mm hmm. Because if you're you if you're not using the crank after you fire the thing. You've got you've got to you have to you have to stand on the bow part and grab grab the string and pull up until it latches. Mm. Then you then you can put the bolt in and then you can fire the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, other otherwise you otherwise you can use the crank, which is it look it looks like bi they look like bicycle pedals. Uh -huh, I've seen them, yeah. You're supposed to you're supposed to do it completely evenly. If you're slightly off, then the whole then um the whole thing gets screwed up, and you got to start from the top. Hmm. So it's, I mean, yeah, crossbows were easier than regular bows, but not but not easy. You know, it's a mm. a bit more fiddly. Yeah. Well, the, well, one of the early models has the nickname of the tickler because of how easy it is to tr to hit the trigger. Hmm. Oh. But it's but then again, then again, a lot of fantasy games seem to seem to think that a medieval fantasy setting shouldn't have gunpowder for reasons I still don't understand. Mm hmm. I'm guessing you've had you've had that issue as well of what why is. If it's supposed to be based on medieval Europe, why is there not gunpowder? I always include firearms in pretty much every medieval setting. I I think only in highly situational cases I would I wouldn't allow it. But yeah, there, there is no no point in, in banning it. I mean, even if you're not even if you're not allowing say, say um say personal rifles or ha or hand cannons. Cannons are still a thing, and when you have magic involved, what's stop what's stopping someone from doing something stupid like, um, car like carrying a cannon like it's a personal like it's a um personal weapon? <laughs> so I don't know about you, but I th I think that'd be funny, you know, some big some big guy carrying a cannon like it's a minigun. Mm hmm. If you want to go like berserk like guts with his cannon arm. Well, there's that, there's that. Although, although that me the metal hand that Guts has is somewhat based in history. There was Goat's mm -hmm. the Iron Hand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there there is a method to the to the madness. But I've always told people believability should trump realism. Because mm -hmm. the audience wants to be tricked. It's just do it in do it in a way that they can go that they can go along with it and sometimes there are a lot of things that we ignore from history have you taken a look at the well at the official first submarine um i think i i think i have that was in i believe that was in that awkward period where where they were still messing around with ironclads made by an alchemist completely made out of wood and he had this bottled oxygen he had several mm -hmm. bottles of bottled oxygen and and he went 
Uh, he used it perfectly under the I forget the name of this river in in England, and he made a successful journey with a crew. But a lot of people ignore that that was uh, at least as as we know it the first submarine so primitive, and yet it was effective. Yeah, and it also looked like a giant acorn. Mm-hmm. And there's been. It is it is interesting looking at say the er, the um early the early attempts at flight mm-hmm. and how 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 some people thought you needed to have these ridiculous wings or the the infamous case where somebody thought having wings that try and mimic a bird flapping wi- their wings was was going to be a way to ha- have an ideal plane mm-hmm. the thing cr- the thing crashed on its first test. Mm. Shocking, I know. <laughs> oh. But then then again, um th- then again, the, you you look through his you look through history and you'll find vi- you'll find various sto- you'll find various stories of craziness. I I can't remember the name, but I remember that there is a certain um folk hero in parts of in parts of Mexico, who and to celebrate the big thing is those explosive hammers. Mm-hmm. I can't... Mm. It's on the tip of my tongue, and but the the idea is just is just these hammers that end up making a loud bang when they hit something. Mm-hmm. I'm uh, trying to to remember, but mm, doesn't doesn't ring a bell for the moment. Oh. Um. Um, Mexico is actually really good when it comes to exploring all of those myths and, and using them in your tabletop RPGs. I don't know uh, how much do you know about Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. I'm familiar. Uh-huh. Did you know that he was actually a man? He was a, yeah. a man, a red-haired, green eye, no, blue-eyed man. Red, red hair, red beard, blue eyes, and his title was Quetzalcoatl, and you have so many legends about him. And he eventually got turned into this uh, feathered serpent, serpent, but that was more like his, his spirit animal. Mm-hmm. And he's like the wow, like one of the big heroes in mythology. In the history books of Mexico, from the CEP, the Secretaría de Educación Pública, it's kind of like the mainstream education from a few decades back. You have his image all over the books, but then they started to distort things, and yeah, now you cannot find the image of the red-haired, blue-eyed guy that was Quetzalcoatl. Mm-hmm. Um, and i i did f- i did find wh- i did find where this partic- the um person in question that that I was referring to, um, San Juanito, or San uh, okay. Juan T- Juan Tito, sorry, um. San Juanito. It must be San Juanito. Yeah. Um, who en- ended up ended up do- getting into a f- getting into a fight with with um la- with landowners and in San Juan de la Vega, there's reenactments with the exploding hammers mm-hmm. like every every February. Yeah. Now it starts to sound. Uh huh. And all, all that it is is just attaching firecrackers to a sledgehammer. <laughs> <laughs> Although, but it sounds awesome in practice, kind of like that hammer from ah, Alita, the battle angel that had like this turbine behind it, and <laughs> yeah, like a crazy sci- science fantasy weapon. Yeah. Well, I I have a habit of giving my player of giving my players extremely powerful but extremely unsafe weapons. Mm-hmm. The the um, template that I always tell people, as far as what I mean by powerful but unsafe, is the noisy cricket from Men in Black. Uh huh. You know, just weapons where where it's just as much of a danger to you as it is to whoever you're fi- whoever you're shooting it at. Mm hmm. Oh, because of course the noisy cricket do- does a lot of damage, but you're also going to get knocked on your ass twenty feet. Mm hmm. Oh. The more infamous case was the, um, was the up button, 
which was this rune trap that you step on the thing, you go straight up. Mm-hmm. Um, for four at um forty miles an hour for six seconds. Oh, uh huh. And if you're thinking some, I remember one because one time a dragon stepped on it, and the GM was was like, "Well, well, it hit the ceiling. Now it's coming down." I was like, "No, it's not. It hasn't been six seconds." <laughs> It doesn't. It does not. Ki- the spell's command is it. Go- whatever steps on this goes up for six seconds, and spells are very specific on these kind of things, or very loose, so somebody can find a loophole. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and well, in well, in this particular case. The this dra- that that dragon was in a cave that was lined with adamantite. Mm-hmm. So that's not but that's not budging. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens when you have an unstoppable force and an immovable object? Mm-hmm. What happens is the dragon becomes chunky salsa. Mm-hmm. I can imagine. Or the equivalent of putting a car in a compactor. Unless it's an adamantite dragon, perhaps um, it was a black dragon. Black dragon. Oh no, yeah, he's Dr- dragon salsa. Yeah, <laughs> dragon salsa, and we all we all had to we all had to do con- we all had to do constitution checks because you, to avo- to avoid losing one's lunch, as it were. <laughs> I thought you would have to make a dexterity saving throw to avoid the pieces of the dragon falling on top of you. No, oh, that was that wasn't the problem. Everybody was out, everybody was out of range. It was dealing with the smell. Uh. On the plus side, the village got dra- got dragon meat for about three months. <laughs> <laughs> but you know those those sorts of those sorts of crazy. So many people want to try and go realistic with their games. I'm like, you're wasting. You've got a golden opportunity to do all sorts of bullshit you can't do in other mediums. Mm-hmm. But with that with that in mind, uh I believe the you've recently um You've recently been ta- been tackling st- um, stuff like Dragonbane and um, Nightfell. Um, mm-hmm. What would what if you if you can? What would you say you you have you have planned down the road as far as what you'd be tackling in um, in terms of core books? Mm, well, right now I have a bunch of uh, free league stuff. I have just received the review copy of the Walking Dead universe. A core book, mm-hmm. and I also have all of the lines so far when it comes to the core books of Mutant Year Zero. So I'm looking forward to uh, showing people what those books are all about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I I will certainly be keeping an keeping an eye out. Uh, but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Mm, no, I really want to thank you uh, because, well, I thought you only interviewed like game designers and creators, so it was an honor uh, to be invited. Mm-hmm. No, I I try and get I try and get anybody that anybody that I can who's got an interesting story. Mm-hmm. But as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!